fascist and fascism is everywhere used to describe any one and any political movement, even slightly to the right of the far left in contemporary politics. Furthermore, the virtues and the values of the actual generation that defeated fascism in the 1940s would be labeled fascist by today's left-wing standards. This, of course, is not accidental. It is essential to the Marxist imagination of fascism since the end of World War II. Fascism lost the Second World War. Communism lost the Cold War. Yet Marxism is winning the historical imagination in the 21st century. And we must understand why and how Marxism's historical imagination has caused a reevaluation of capitalism and fascism. Originally, fascism was the political theory of state corporatism and authoritarianism, where the state, headed by a dictator or strongman acting on behalf of the people, the nation, ruled with a sort of absolute supremacy. Giovanni Gentili, in his The Doctrine of Fascism, co-authored by Mussolini, described fascism very succinctly as the philosophy which would manifest, quote, the century of the state, end quote. Fascism is, in its original iteration, the philosophy, the political philosophy of state supremacism. The fascist century dreamt by the original fascist theorists and leaders conceived itself as the energetic zeal emanating from the spirit of the people, channeled into the formation of a state which would act as the uniting spirit of newly formed nations. We must not forget here in the historical reality of fascism that though certain peoples had a long history, their nations had only recently been formed, like Italy in 1861, and Germany in 1871, or even more recently having gained independence only after the end of World War I, and thus state building was conceived as the next historical step of national development, and that is what fascism presented itself as. No one nowadays means fascism to be a political philosophy of state supremacism when used, either self-descriptively or as a pejorative as it is often used by political opponents. So what happened? How did we go from fascism being a very particular movement, a particular movement in political philosophy, to now being everybody who is not far left and socialist is a fascist? What happened was fascism's own self-transformation once in power and the analysis of it by critics, especially Marxist critics, during the 1930s and then at the end of World War II. Having achieved political power, fascist governments promoted an aggressive foreign policy of expansion, often with the goal of achieving living space or Lebensraum, as famously adopted by the Nazi party in Germany. This aggressive foreign policy of aggrandizement and expansion tied with the idea of living space, then united with the hereditarian biologism of late 19th century race science, ensuring the eventual marriage of state supremacy with racial supremacy. The state is the ultimate actor of the will of the people, but the people the state is the ultimate expression of is a racial people, which excludes, of course, other groups of people, even if they reside within the nation. Hence, certain racial laws that were passed, especially in Nazi Germany. Only true-blooded Germans counted as the people that the state was responsible for. Thankfully, as we know, Fascism was defeated by the Allies in World War II. However, the defeat of fascism, 
alongside its spectacular rise to power in the decade after the tragedy of World War I, caused Marxist philosophers and intellectuals to reanalyze capitalism, the nature of the bourgeoisie, and the new phenomenon that Marx did not live to see and therefore didn't write about, but they would have to deal with and write about. Fascism. The East German playwright and philosopher Bertolt Brecht aptly summarized the emergent new Marxist understanding of fascism as early as 1935. Fascism, he said, is a historic phase of capitalism. Brecht would go on to say, quote, how can anyone tell the truth about fascism unless he is willing to speak out against capitalism, which brings it forth, end quote. To be against fascism, Brecht elaborated, meant one had to be against capitalism because capitalism brings forth fascism. To be against capitalism meant one was fighting against fascism. The Cambridge Five, the infamous ring of British spies working for the Soviet Union, thought the same. Marxism, in the form of the Soviet Union at the time, was the best political system to fight against fascism. In the new Marxist historical imagination, the fight against fascism is what really matters because capitalism's disintegration of all social bonds through its relentless industrialization and commercialization, its exploitation of humanity, and reorganization of social life around urban work made humans weak and prone to the eventual state authoritarianism of the dictator, of fascism. Fascism then appears as the bulwark against revolutionary socialism, which would attract the support, according to the new Marxists, of the bourgeoisie, the patriotic middle class of any nation who would fear the revolutionary other. Therefore, capitalism and fascism are interlinked and depend on each other. In fascist countries, capitalism continues to exist, but only in the form of fascism, writes Bertolt Brecht. He also continues on to say that, quote, Fascism can be combated as capitalism alone, as the nakedest, most shameless, most oppressive, and most treacherous form of capitalism, end quote. Under this new Marxist view, fascism is the final expression of exhausted capitalism, or what is also called, especially now in the 21st century, late capitalism. Late capitalism, a term first used by Werner Sombart, was popularized by the Marxist economist and philosopher Ernest Mandel during the Cold War. Late capitalism, Mandel's magnum opus by that title, attempted to explain what Marx did not witness. The failure of the working class to launch the proletariat revolution, the 1950s and 1960s economic boom, and the shift of capitalist modes of economics away from industrial work to financialization, leading to globalized markets and mass consumption for a significant portion of the world's population. The exhaustion, however, of late capitalism into financial consumerism would lead to the reemergence of fascism, which would be the attempt by capitalism to defend itself at the end of its exploitative and oppressive development, wherein the racial majority of a capitalist country would vehemently scapegoat and go to war against the foreign other. The scapegoated other would be the image held up as the enemy by a devolving capitalism to hide the failures of late capitalism in its final descent into disintegration and authoritarian fascism within that process of capitalist disintegration. This is the new Marxist historical imagination. Suddenly, so much left-wing rhetoric makes sense once understood through the Marxist historical imagination. 
We are living in the early stages of the new fascism, according to the Marxist mind. Marxism, as we can now understand it since 1945, is not the mere economic and political theory of Marx's social history, but principally a vision of unfolding history within the historical epoch of capitalism, centering around the collapse of capitalism and its descent into fascism, which, of course, by self-serving nature, proves Marx's basic point of capitalism correct, exploitative oppression. In the new Marxist imagination, capitalism becomes fascism, liberalism becomes fascism, conservatism becomes fascism, Christianity becomes fascism. And how often have we heard this? pointed out and shouted by the new left and the new Marxists. Everything is fascist. This is the basic narrative proclaimed by the new Marxists. This idea and narrative of world history is very pervasive among the Western educated elite and intelligentsia, a core segment of the professoriate at elite universities and state universities, especially those educated at the elite universities who read the many post-war Marxist thinkers, among lawyers and journalists, and also among a new generation of university students who have swallowed wholesale, without any critical thinking, this basic vision and understanding of the history of the world. To save the world from fascism means to save the world from capitalism, and especially to save the oppressed scapegoated victims of late capitalism from the abuse of would-be fascists. Fascists can be anyone, you, me, our neighbors. To be an anti-fascist means one must actively oppose capitalism and actively help the oppressed people exploited by late stage fascistic capitalism. Fascists literally are everywhere in the Marxist view of world history because you either become a fascist or an anti-fascist. That is the new dichotomy of understanding human organization in the post-1945 Marxist imaginary. Instead of the capitalist and the proletariat, you now have the fascist and the anti-fascist. Humans are, of course, instinctively narrative creatures. We live by stories. Our identities are shaped by the stories and narratives we tell ourselves. And unless a different story can be told in the current world epoch in which we live, the Marxist story of late capitalism and its descent into fascism and the emerging danger of fascist catastrophe will be the narrative that dominates our world and the next generation. As so many of us already know, it is the story that dominates our world and the next generation. But ignoring this is, of course, perilous. Confronting this story is the imperative of liberty. But in trying to understand why fascism underwent this transformation and change from a particular political philosophy, meaning state supremacy, to becoming the term and the terminology used by the new left and left-wing forces everywhere to describe everyone who is not with them, we must understand the new Marxist imagination, the new Marxist historical imagination, which conceived of fascism as the final exhausted moment of the capitalist epoch in which everyone would either become a fascist or an anti-fascist. Knowing this history allows us to make a better understanding of the rhetoric, the political rhetoric, and the world we now live in, dominated by the language of the new Marxism.